Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. This is the Tech Time Traveler, and today we're having a look at a peculiar little Apple II clone from a company you may have heard of under another name. You know you're a little too hardcore as a collector when you purchase something on your hit list, receive it, and then forget about it for a long time. Uh, this machine was sold as non-working, which, if you know eBay, is a remarkably honest assessment. Actually, it turns out I bought this one from one of my future patrons. Honesty is really cool when it comes to eBay. A lot of vintage slash retro tech eBay sellers love to use the weasel word untested, which can be honest, but often is just the seller's way of avoiding a description of broken for product condition and the accompanying hit and value that comes with that. Anyway, this seller was honest, which was awesome, and I got what I felt was a good deal anyway. So I opened it up to do a cursory examination and discovered that it might need some socket cleaning with something like Deoxit. So naturally, I put it away on the shelf for four years. I suppose that's sort of how my ADHD brain works. It wasn't that I was too lazy to do some basic cleaning work, it's that I live in an area where Deoxit really isn't sold. And for some reason, I find the act of jumping on Amazon and hunting things down exhausting, especially when I don't really know anything about what it is I'm trying to buy. So I kept hemming and hawing and didn't pull the trigger until just now. All right, so what is the Multitech Microprofessor 2? And who was Multitech? Well, first, you might recognize Multitech under a different name. Does this seem familiar? Yeah, this was one of Acer's very first microcomputing products, the other being the Microprofessor 1, which had kind of a similar form factor, but was a Zilog Z80-based design that had nothing to do with Apple whatsoever. For version 2, Acer, I mean Multitech, decided to horn in on the growing market of Apple II clone. They say imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, but Apple doesn't do flattery. You know, Apple might well have just ended up like any other struggling microcomputer firm from the 1970s, one of dozens and dozens to spring up with the arrival of the microprocessor, only to disappear a few years later, but they had a few lucky breaks. The original Apple II was a masterstroke of idiosyncratic engineering. Steve Wozniak, its designer, practically squeezed every last gate out of every chip. Recognizing the future value of gaming, he gave the machine color graphics, a rarity in the mid-70s, and an easy expansion bus, sound, you name it. But all of that might not have mattered for much if not for the all-important software. The Apple II had been the launch platform for a little spreadsheet offering called VisiCalc. VisiCalc caused small business owners to stand up and take notice. The Apple II, or rather by then, the Apple II Plus, began to attract more and more interest, more users, and thus more software developers. Apple also made decent inroads into the education market. This virtuous circle helped build a company, but also gave rise to competitors looking to cash in on that sizable user base. A company called Franklin was one of the first and boldly tried to create more or less a direct copy of the Apple II with some improvements. Apple sued on the basis that their ROM code was protected by copyright. Amazingly, they initially lost. Courts at the time were only just becoming familiar with the digital world and initially found that something in binary form didn't qualify for copyright. Apple, of course, appealed and won and then drove Franklin and others promptly into the ground. But while Apple was able to crush domestic would-be competitors, the foreign variety proved tougher to crack. Asia had a little less reverence for American intellectual property and plenty of companies cranked up production. When Apple managed to get their products seized at the border, they simply changed tactics, shipping machines without the offending EEPROMs, or shipping machines as parts for repair. These were then assembled by unscrupulous dealers who burned their own copies of Apple's ROMs onto these new machines, slapping their own private labels onto them, which is how we get machines like this quote-unquote Linden. Multitech might well have been another bootlegger, but they had a legitimate and growing business in the US, and their CEO didn't want to play with fire. So Multitech put together a machine that they would call Apple II compatible, but without 99% of the compatibility. Meet the Multitech Microprofessor II. And if you're struck by how little it looks like a real Apple II, that's exactly what Multitech was going for. Yeah, you could fit a stack of these inside a real Apple II case. The keyboard was a chiclet mess borrowed from the MPF1, and if that wasn't bad enough for you, they also included a larger external rubber chiclet keyboard as an option. Yay. The case was kind of cool. I mean, it's gray and smooth and tablet-like. I really like it, actually. You had just one expansion port, though, on the side, and that was for the disk drive for the most part. Around back, you had a standard array of power and I.O. ports, including an RF out, something the original Apple II design didn't include, as well as a tape interface. There were also a pair of ports for printer and joystick. If you needed Chinese characters, there was an additional slab that looked more or less like the MPF2 itself that stacked underneath. 
Speaking of characters, unlike the Apple II, the MPF2 offered a series of Petski-like graphics characters you could play around with. The MPF2 also had a full 64 kilobytes of RAM out of the box, no need for a language card, and it featured a version of BASIC and ROM that was similar to, but not the same as Apple's offering, and a machine language monitor. I have no idea how many of these were produced, but today they're rarely found, so when this one came up with disk drive, manuals, and printer, I of course hopped on it. These machines can fetch a few hundred bucks pretty easily. Brand new, they retailed for around 400 bucks, which was a lot back then, but still a heck of a lot less than an $1,100 Apple II Plus. Now, I'd love to fire this thing up for a quick demo, but unfortunately, as I mentioned, it was sold as non-working and the seller meant it. Seriously, this is all it does on power up. Yeah, not good. But not horrible either. I mean, at least we have a steady video display and easily recognizable characters. The machine seems to be just frozen, and it might be as simple as bad RAM, ROM, or CPU or something. I hope. But let's get the lid off here and have a look. Wow, what a crazy compact board. <laughs> I mean, if you've ever been in the presence of a real Apple II, you'll understand how tiny this is. We have our 6502 CPU in the center here, 64 kilobytes of RAM down the side, two EEPROMs, and this little daughter board I'm not sure the exact function of. At first blush, things don't look bad at all. However, on closer inspection, it's clear this machine has had some exposure to moisture. The TV channel selector switch here is rusted pretty good, and there's this weird white residue around some of the chip sockets, almost like leftover calcium deposits from evaporated water. This of course is a bad thing. If the PCB was exposed to moisture, we could be chasing gremlins all over the place. However, the main chips we are worried about are socketed, so it might be worth removing those and giving things a clean first. To handle the cleaning end of things, I finally broke down and bought a very small bottle of Deoxit after doing a bunch of research online about which one to choose. This stuff is not common at all in my neck of the woods, and it's seriously expensive. This bottle of D100 is 50 bucks. This stuff had better clean contacts perfectly and bring about world peace for that price. I'll start with the RAM chips here. Yeah, that white residue is all over the place. What is that? So like I said, I did some reading online about Deoxit. D100 apparently is the pure stuff, whereas D50 is a lower concentration and has a propellant in it so it can be sprayed. I'm not really sure why you want one over the other, but I've noticed that most electronics repair channels seem to showcase the D50 more often. I read that you need just a tiny amount of this stuff to be effective, but squeezing the bottle so precisely is really hard, even with the needle dropper here, and I kind of end up flooding the sockets anyway. Oh well, what's 50 bucks, right? After an hour though, the results are pretty impressive. The white residue is gone, and I can see a bit of shine on the socket pins. The instructions say to remove excess with cloth. I'm not sure how that would work here. I tried dabbing up the excess deoxit with a Q-tip, but that may have been a mistake since it leaves fibers everywhere. All right, let's plug in the RAM again and see what happens. Well, we've got a change for sure. A color now, but still no boot up. Okay, let's check those other chips, particularly the CPU and EEPROM. Yeah, more corrosion. Ugh. I really hope this hasn't eaten into the traces of the PCB. If that's the case, finding and fixing the problem will be a nightmare. All right, let's play stuff back here. For this test, I've swapped in a complete set of known good RAM chips from my Ferguson Big Board 2, just to eliminate those as a suspect. Nope. So the screen is changing, so that's something, but uh, yeah, still no action. Since I have a ton of spare Commodore parts kicking around, I figure I'll try swapping the CPU. I've never had a bad CPU in any of my repair adventures, but there's always a first time, right? And here we go. Holy cow, it worked. Unbelievable. The keyboard seems to work. Um, yeah, but when I enter in gibberish, it gives me what looks like a syntax error and then promptly freezes up. That doesn't seem normal. I'll try the usual infinite print test program here and see if that gets us anywhere. Nope. Yeah, I've seen this sort of behavior before with my real Apple IIs, and as I recall, it was a bad ROM or two that gave you random nonsense like this. Darn it. Yeah, we seem to have partial functionality. I can't call up the machine language monitor, but it does look like I can save stuff to tape. Can I load? Uh, yeah, I'm not really sure without hooking up a tape drive or something. Uh, also, some commands like graphics mode or GR seem to work just fine. And if I put them in a program, it'll run but I can't list the program. So yeah, BASIC is definitely broken. Now, I was hoping to dump the ROMs and compare them to a known good copy of them that I found online, 
But even that route isn't so easy. The chips don't bear any recognizable part numbers. I eventually figure out by looking at the silkscreen that they're 2564s, which are of course an oddball thing my reader doesn't really support too well. Dang it. My GQ4X4 comes with definitions for 2564s, but it has a disclaimer that says test, and reading online it seems they can only be read, not written. I guess for now that doesn't matter, I just want to confirm if they're the issue. But reading them proves to be really hard. At first I get a lot of random nonsense. I figured out the chip legs had a little bit of corrosion on them, so I cleaned them up. And now I can read them, but only the first 4 kilobytes of each chip. After the 4K mark, it's blank. So that can't be right. Uh, reading further online, it may be due to differences in pinout between the 2564 and the more readily supported 2764. Possibly I need an adapter of some kind to swap some pins and read properly. I'll have to figure that out, but for now I just want to see if I can get around BASIC and get this thing to do anything else just to evaluate the degree to which it's working. So now I'm going to test that load T command with one of my spy tabs. Man, I regret ever getting these pieces of junk. They are on offer from my cell phone provider, Rogers. The salesperson had me believing they were a free part of a package deal for unlimited data. These tablets turned out to be absolutely the slowest, worst performing pieces of crap I've ever had. And it later turned out that I'm paying 15 bucks a month for these. What? However, these abominations do have one useful thing, if you can wait 10 minutes for them to start up, a 3.5 millimeter earphone port. That feature vanished from my cell phone generations ago, and having that to play tape files is just a heck of a lot more convenient than trying to convert WAV files into something that I can play on a tape. Now, as I mentioned before, the MPF2 is not compatible for the most part at all with the Apple II. This magazine article spells it out. The MPF2 has a different memory map than the Apple II, so only a little bit of basic software will work with it. Pretty much nothing that relies on graphics will work without it being patched or changed in some way. So I have to look for MPF2 specific software online, which given how low volume this machine seems to have been, might be really tricky. Actually scratch that, it's downright impossible. I couldn't find anything specifically for the MPF2. However, thankfully there was a machine that cloned the MPF2 made by MicroDigital of Brazil. Yes, you heard me correctly, someone in Brazil cloned this Apple II non-clone. Not only that, they shoved it into what looks like an Atari 800 case with a real keyboard. While the MPF2 doesn't appear to have much of a user base, the TK2000 seems to have gained a decent following, and it appears some resourceful Brazilian programmers managed to port a bunch of Apple II software over to the TK2000. Since the TK2000 is basically a clone of the MPF2, the software should pretty much work for my purposes. The library of TK2000 stuff available online here is just a sliver of the totality of Apple II software, but at least it's something. And I immediately recognize some familiar titles like Karotica, as well as Choplifter, and other Apple II games I once played. Now these appear to be in a CT2 file format, which I don't really recognize. I eventually figure out they're a tape archive format developed in Brazil, and there is a player that decodes them into actual tones. The player is in Portuguese, but I can kind of figure out what its options are. In fact, the player has a switch that lets you write CT2 files out as WAV files. So I'll use that to convert some of these into WAV, and then I'll save them onto my tablet to be played to the MPF2. Will it work? Well, initially, no. Uh, the first tablet I hooked up for some reason doesn't want to detect the MPF2 connected to the earphone port. So it just plays the tape on speaker. I was concerned that maybe the jack on the MPF2 was damaged, given that the corrosion is all over that area, but when I connected my other tablet, yes, I'm a dummy, like I said, I upgraded not once but twice with these stupid things. So, okay, let's see what happens when we try to load Choplifter. Well, it does seem to be doing something. The uh, screen is going a little crazy, which has me worried it's kind of crashing. But eventually we get a stable load message showing the blocks for CHOP coming in, and I assume CHOP is just shorthand for CHOP lifter. It takes about three and a half minutes to load the full thing, but once loaded, bingo bango, it works. Uh, I don't think I can control with keyword or anything though. No, uh, this is almost certainly a joystick control game. Unfortunately, Choplifter seems to require a joystick, so I really can't do anything. Uh, but yeah, there's no doubt the system is working well enough to load it. Oh wait, uh, actually there does seem to be some keyboard controls here, but yeah, I can't stop the helicopter from flying all the way to the left. Alright, well, let's just move along here. Let's try Karatika. 
Yeah, I'm less certain about this one given how the screen is jumping around and the tape file is incredibly long. It's like eight and a half minutes. But then the title screen appears and that leads me to think, yeah, maybe this is working. Yeah, man, eight minutes. You had to be really patient to load a game like this via tape. And then if something went wrong, ugh. So we get to the introduction, or what looks like one, and for some reason I instinctively hit the pause button on the tablet. And yeah, it kind of seems like it's not working, uh, but then I decide I'm going to press the play button again because it looks like it wants to load. And so it carries on loading. And yeah, after another four minutes, yeah, there it is. That's definitely Karotica in full color. Yeah, it looks like it's working. So uh, yeah, let me see if I can figure out the keys here. Uh, yeah, but I don't know which Good ones are. What are you doing? Ooh, and I promptly get my butt kicked. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't struck out that badly since my days as a door-to-door -door salesman. Oh hi, I just came to see if you'd be interested in an extended sword warranty. Is that a no? You know, we also cover barbarian jockstraps. Okay, so I feel like there's gotta be some disk image files out there somewhere, right? I mean, it's quite possible, given Brazil is a little poorer than the US, that people stuck with tape rather than disk drives. But I feel like at least some TK2000 owners had the disk drive option. So I did a little bit more hunting and eventually, yes, I did find that there were some TK2000 disk images available. So that means it's time to dig into a piece of software I kind of have a love-hate relationship with, ADT Pro. Now don't get me wrong, I really appreciate ADT Pro and the ability to basically send disks and write disks on Apple II from my PC. But ADT Pro isn't always the easiest thing to get running sometimes. I usually have to spend an hour figuring out why it won't start up, why it won't talk to the Apple II, won't find the RXTX library even though it was right there and worked just a few months ago, yada yada. Yeah, something always breaks between uses and then I have to spend serious time figuring out what went wrong. By the way, the most common reason for the missing RXTX error message has to do with not having the correct version of Java installed. And again, I don't understand how that happened because my machine was working with this not that long ago, but anyway, if you're running a 64-bit system, it needs to be 64-bit Java, and apparently my system had reverted somehow to 32-bit. One problem with a large collection is stuff often goes missing, and that was the case with my Super Serial card. I have two, but only one has the header piece with the 25-pin connector. I would have thought I'd left it in one of my Apple IIs, but after searching every single one, nope, it's gone. So I have to resort to using my Apple III with its built-in serial card, and I'm hoping the disk drive, which is occasionally wonky, is feeling alright today. I will say I do enjoy using the III whenever I have the occasion. It's a unique, quirky machine. I like the kind of low-key clunking sounds the disk drive makes, and the keyboard, despite being fixed in place, is actually pretty pleasant to type on. Anyway, I have to put it into the system monitor here so I can enter this bootstrapper ADT Pro uses to download itself since I lost my ADT Pro boot disk. The program seems to be working, evidenced by the inverse high in the upper right corner. But we don't seem to be getting any action, and this is most likely a cabling issue. Which is strange because all I have is a straight cable connected to a null modem cable. But I'll try reversing the RX and TX lines anyway with my breakout box and see what happens. Yeah, reversing the lines seems to have done it, which makes no sense at all, but anyway, yeah, that's kind of what drives me nuts with serial stuff, kids. So, yeah, we're at loading kernel now, and that's looking good. Or maybe not. It's still not working right. While it downloaded ADT Pro K, okay, it's still not able to communicate properly with my PC host machine. And we're once again back to fiddling with cables. It's bizarre, but it ended up working only if I used the two cables joined together with my breakout box in the middle. And the weird thing is the breakout box isn't doing anything now. I removed the crossovers from RX and TX and yeah, it's just working. It just kind of like wants it to be there, I guess. And now I can communicate with the host doing directory listings and stuff like that. Bueno. Anyway, now that it's there, I'm finally able to archive those darn Soundbuster discs I promised to archive many years ago. Which is great, since these floppies are most definitely on borrowed time. So yeah, I'll post the link to download them on my Tech Time Traveler website if you guys want to check those out. Uh, the software for the Yam Soundbuster, which was a really rare sound card, uh, is based in BASIC, so you can actually kind of play around with it a little bit. 
All right, so now to get down to business and try writing some discs. There were a decent number to choose from, so I just picked a bunch at random I thought might be interesting. So the first game I'm trying is called Missiles Defense. And it does seem to boot up right away, and I'm just gonna note something interesting here, this Compatiboot thing. We will see this on other discs. I'm wondering if this is a patch that lets the machine run generic Apple II software? If so, it might be interesting to learn more about how it works and how it can be applied to other titles. Yep, Missile Defense works fine, and although the keys used for controls are placed in nearly impossible positions, I can sort of do something. Yeah, I just find this tiny little chiclet keyboard so difficult to work with, and yeah, my base is pretty much wiped out uh, within a few seconds. The next one I wanted to try was a DOS disk for the TK2000, but it refuses to load and drops me into the system monitor instead. And I note the system monitor appears to work just fine. Okay, let's try another one. This game is called Falcons. Interestingly, it mentions different control devices, including the Apple III. Since neither this machine nor the TK2000 had anything to do with the Apple III at all, I'm guessing this program must have simply been patched, maybe by Plansoft or a third party, using the Compatiboot thing again. This appears to be some kind of Space Invaders style game, and yeah, it moves pretty smoothly, and the keyboard keys used aren't too onerous. Oh, this is, yeah, this keyboard sucks. <laughs> that's, uh, that's what that is. At least I have a chance in this one. I don't have like 50 keys to worry about. At the same time, like missile defense. Okay. My aim sucks. I imagine this just keeps getting faster. What the? So the next game I'm trying here is the bit ominously named Suicide. Yeah, it's kind of what it describes itself to be. You have basically a bunch of friends who have decided to jump to their deaths for some reason, and your job is to prevent it. So it's sort of like Breakout, but their bodies aren't bricks. Okay. Now what? I guess I'm trying to stop my friends from committing suicide. Is that literally what this is? This is goofy. <laughs> what the hell? Oh no. Oh, these sh crappy keys. I guess I can do away with using kept putting my finger on the up and down. No! Sorry. Okay. Nope. Just judge that one. Oh wow, this is getting really hard. What the hell is that? What the frick happened there? Yeah, I have no idea what's up with that. Weird. For the final game, I'll try one I remember from Commodore 64 days, Moon Patrol. This game was hard with a joystick. Does it even work with a keyboard? Eh, maybe not. Oh wait, yes it does. You just have to select keyboard at the beginning. Keyboard, spacebar. That is loud. <laughs> uh, right, how do we jump? Okay. I think there's been so long since I've played this game. Ooh, it's bogging down. Yeah, there we go. Shooting. <laughs> Dead. Yeah, the keys are not well placed. It's like a finger traffic jam here. Nope, this is way too hard. <laughs> well, yeah, I guess that's kind of it for now. I mean, overall, I'm pretty happy with where we're sitting here. I can't believe I waited four years just to try this thing out properly. 
But yes, this MPF2 does seem to work for the most part just fine, which really isn't an issue for me because, you know, with this keyboard, there's absolutely no way I'm sitting down to program anything meaningful and basic on this thing. I think my next project thusly will just be to find a way to dump the EEPROMs properly so that I can confirm their contents, and then hopefully by then I'll have a way to burn new ones. So what do I think of the MPF2? Was it good value for money? Well, can't argue with the price. 400 bucks is a lot less than the 1100 or so a new Apple IIe would have cost you back then. That said, having almost zero compatibility with existing Apple II software, plus, let's face it, this form factor is a joke. I mean, sure, it was highly portable and took up way less desk space, but this chiclet keyboard, <laughs> well, both of them, in fact, that were on offer, yeah, they were all horrible. I would not want to type in even simple commands on that thing, let alone do any serious programming or word processing tasks. And you all saw how gaming turned out. And of course, you have just one expansion slot, which seems to be dedicated mostly to the floppy drive, so that's not so great either. Yeah, I don't know. I think a lot would have hinged on whether the MPF2 users managed to find patched or ported software for their machines as easily as the TK2000 users did, or third-party add-ons that allowed them to expand its capabilities. If they did, then that kind of changes the value proposition completely. Overall, from an historic standpoint, I think it's a unique and interesting little machine, and it's especially important as one of Acer's first computers. And it's quite rare, too. I've only ever seen a handful over the years come up on eBay. They always fetch hundreds of dollars. Yeah, there's more than a few crazy people like me who collect Apple II clones. Definitely in a future video, we'll look at repairing this thing further, fixing the basic ROMs, and I'll see if there's anything else interesting it can do, and especially I'd like to see if I can make the printer work. But for this video, that's kind of it. So if you've enjoyed it, please smack that like button. If not, dislike is there waiting for you. Excuse me? If you're new here and you like what you're seeing, please consider subscribing. And if you really like what I do, feel free to join my Patreon, which has various perks like early access to my videos and patron-only content, including an extended-length as-it-happened version of this very video. Thanks so much for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.